If you're new with us, I've met several of you. Thank you for being here with us. Typically, we preach through books of the Bible, and so you came on a very special Sunday, right? We're in the book of Song of Solomon. We're starting chapter 4, and if you're new with us, we'll go ahead and just put this out there so it's, it's out there in all fairness. This is one of the weirdest passages in all of Scripture, right? So poke your spouse and say, thanks for coming on the weird day, right? Of all, we don't skip. This is why we preach through books of the Bible, so we don't get tempted to skip the things that are hard or the things that are uh, weird. We tackle every bit of scripture straight through the books. Now, once we finish the book of of Solomon, we'll move into the book of John. And so we're excited about that. But we're glad that you're here this morning and, and ready to tackle the rest of this book, this chapter 4, with us. Up to this point, if you've missed, here's a a very simple explanation up to this point that leads us to chapter 4. This is following a couple, a man and a woman, right? A Shulamite woman and uh, King Solomon. And so this is following their relationship together. This is two real people in a real day, in a real setting, in a real relationship. And so it's following them in a relationship. Here's where they are. They are longing to be together. They're longing to be married. They're under that area of dating and then, you know, courtship or engagement. And they are, are longing this day in which they can be together forever. And so this is what we see as we study this book together. They are hungry and they're seeking this out As we came to chapter 3 last week, what we saw um, in this relationship was this deep, deep, deep desire that I just mentioned for the two, for one another to be together. And, And we understand this about this book, that if we only look at this book through this relationship, and this is a very modern idea, to look at this book of Song of Solomon as as just about a relationship between two people, uh, that's a pretty new way of looking at this book. The the Jews, those who originally had this book, they would look at this book, they would follow their two lives, but they knew that there was this spiritual aspect to this, that this was really not just about a man and a woman, but this was about their relationship with God. So this is how they viewed this book. And I believe that it is both, yes, it's the real woman and a real man and a real relationship, but it really is, and we cannot miss this, that it's meant to point us to this greater truth that God first longs to be with us and that we have this longing to be with God. And so we're supposed to have this spiritual aspect to it. Last week we were looking at this in depth and and we asked this simple question, do we hunger for God in the way that the Shulamite woman hungered for her soon-to-be husband, right? For her king. Do we long for him in that way? And and this was a an incredible lesson. I hope that you'll go back and listen to it on our website there because it, it calls us to answer and to ask of ourselves some very difficult questions. But as we get into chapter 4, this first part here of chapter 4, their they're pre- preparation, they're really at their wedding, right? They're at their wedding, fixing to partake in the, in the wedding hall, fixing to have the wedding feast together. That's where we pick up today uh, here. Now, as we look at what they're saying to each other today, because what they're doing, they're in this hall, this banqueting hall, ready to have this feast. And, and they're communicating together, right? So he's telling her how beautiful she is and all the things that he loves about her. And he's really praising her and he's really building her up. And, and if you take a look at this and you only look at this through this, uh, this idea of visual, right? If you're only, if you're a very visual person, you're listening to his words and you're taking it very literally and very visually, it's going to be a really extremely weird passage for you, right? Uh, if you look at what he's saying to her, and you really reflect more on the meaning about what he's saying, the heart behind what he's saying, it's going to make so much more sense. But again, let me show you. I brought a picture. I wanted to show you, if you just take this literally, exactly what he's saying to her, this is what she looks like. Yes. He's saying, you are so super hot. That's what he's saying. You know, so he's using this poetic language here to describe her beauty and he's using repetition here in these phrases over these next few sentences and paragraphs to to get this idea across of the mystery of her beauty, right? What what it's used in scripture, throughout scripture, if you see anything that's repeating, it's to really create, to stop you, and you should stop because it's supposed to build this heightening anticipation for what's to come and this reflecting upon, it's supposed to stop, it's supposed to stop you and you're supposed to reflect and know that this is important, that this is something that is meaningful 
meaningful. This is something that you and I need to stop and grasp. And so here's the reality as we study this together that we have this human desire to be loved, don't we? We have this desire to be loved. And that's the story we're looking at. She desires to be loved by him and he desires to be loved by her. And this is something that, that God has given us. Now, I'll share this with you. Here's where I struggle. The more I've understood this book and the more I've wrestled with this book and the spiritual you know, aspects of this book, I'm having to really wrestle with this because I've, I've come to the conclusion that God deeply loves me, right? I don't deserve it. I don't fully understand it, but the Bible is so clear that God loves me, right? Are you with me on that one? He sent his only son to die in my place to pay the penalty for my sin. Like this is, this is love. I get, I get this love. But I, I have this, this really, I, I have this thing that I, I struggle with. And that's to balance how much God loves me and knows me and desires me and, and my part and my role in that, right? Anybody else struggle with that? Like, here, here's my, I'm, I'm secure in my salvation. So there's times where I want to just rest and relax in my salvation, right? I can't earn anything with God. I just, I just sit in what he's done for me and who I am in him and in him alone. And then on the other side of this coin, I really struggle because I want to pursue him and I want to live my life in such a way with such a passion in ways that truly do honor him. And I want to, I want to do some work, right? I want to do some work for his kingdom. I want to do some work for his glory. I want to show him that, that I appreciate all the work that he's done. And, and then there are other times, again, where I need to come back over here and I need to just rest in who he is. I find myself exhausted and, and I'm so thankful that he does accept me but you know do you struggle with this too do you struggle with this idea of yes I'm secure and I'm saved but I also see that scriptures called me to to really to be and to do so much more but I mean at the same time I, I realize that it's not my being it's not I mean it's not my doing that that creates this salvation in me it's literally a gift from God that I can't earn and I don't deserve it's really about me being but at the same time I want to do some things right I, I want to I want to do some things for the kingdom and I want to do some things for for his glory and, and I'm balancing these two things anybody else struggle with that no one else, just one person. We're great. Everybody else has got it figured out, right? I do think, though, I think that God knew that we'd struggle with this, right? I think God that knew, and some of us, maybe it's personality, right? Some of your personalities are willing and able more to just, you know, to relax and accept and just be who you are because of Christ's work. And others of you are kind of like me. Maybe you're just driven a lot different, right? And your personality lends itself to wanting to do something and to be a part of something and, and just being still and resting in him and what he's done is just really difficult for you. You know, I think God knew that we would struggle with this, right? I think God knew that, that we would wrestle with this because I think when he wrote or allowed this Song of Solomon chapter 4 to be written that um, it, it speaks to this idea, right? It speaks to this idea that this relationship, they love one another and there's a chance, there's a time for them to passionately pursue one another, but there's also a chance for them to sit back and just enjoy the fact that I can trust that I am his and that he is mine. So when Solomon sees her, what he sees when he looks at the Shulamite woman, I think is the exact same thing that God sees when he looks at you and I who are his sons and his daughters in Christ. And listen to how is he going to describe her? Because again, you've got to remember, this is a peasant woman. In the, in the first chapter, she opens up with, you know, I'm dark, I'm, I'm ruddy, the, the sun, I've worked outside, the sun has baked me, I'm not, you know, I'm not elegant, I'm not one of those women. And this, this, this King Solomon, he could have any, any women. I'm, I'm, I'm really not special among other women. And all of those things that she's struggling with, and he's going to speak to this woman today, this very same woman. And so as we look at chapter 4, I want us to hear how he describes describes her here in chapter 4. Let's stand on our feet as we read God's word this morning. He says this, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Some of you, we can't even read that without chuckling a little bit. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shown ewes that have come up from washing, all of which bear twins. And not one among them has lost its young. 
Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built on a row of stones. On it hangs a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Thank you. You may be seated. What's the first thing he's telling her here? He's seeing this beauty in his bride. He's, he's praising her. He's adoring her. And, and I need us to see this. I need us to see this spiritual aspect this morning because for some of this, this is difficult for us to swallow. But this is the very way that God views one of his children. This is his view of us. This is the way that he loves us. He says here, behold, you're beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Again, this is this important truth, this repeti repetition here is showing us. He says, your eyes are doves behind your veils. What are doves? In their culture, a dove was a, was a obviously it's still a bird, right? But the, the symbolism of a dove in their culture has to do with peace, right? It was this idea of a great inner calm and a great inner peace. And so God's design for you and I when we're in relationship, a right relationship with him is that we have this inner peace and this inner calm, right? So as they're sharing in this relationship together, he's communicating when I, I love you and this love that I have for you creates for her this great peace. Remember the last few weeks we've talked about God, about Solomon for her being like God to us, the provider and the protector. When you have a provider and a protector, it brings this great inner peace. If that's in your family, right? My, my wife knows that I am her provider and her protector. And so it gives her this inner peace and the same in your family. And you know the opposite, right? When you can't count on the one you love to be your provider and your protector, then things are chaotic, right? Things are unsafe. Things are unhealthy. And so in this relationship, we're seeing this dove and her eyes are doves. And what he's saying is that when I look, I see this great calm in your eyes. I see this great peace in your eyes. And I'm amazed when I think about this is how God wants to communicate with us. There's this peace. When I look in the, in the eyes of a believer, you, you have this peace and this calm, not because of anything that you've done, but because of the one that you're trusting in, the one that gives you the peace. I've laid in the hospital rooms of those dying and had conversations with people dying. And you look in their eyes and listen in their voice and all of the chaos of this life coming to an end, they are looking in their eyes. They're at peace. They're at peace. Do you have that kind of peace this morning? Do you have that kind of peace? That's God's desire for you that in Christ you would experience that type of peace. You can't earn that. You can't do enough good works to experience that peace. That type of peace is simply a gift from God to his people. Then she said this. He said this. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. There's a line for you guys. Some of you can get home tonight. You're going to try it. You're going to like, I'm moving to the Bible. What chapter was that? Chapter 4. You're like, I need to say something nice to my wife. Here's what I need to say. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. And she's going to be like, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You bless me so much. So what's he talking about here? You know, as I thought about this, I was thinking, you know, let's, let's put ourselves into the story, right? This is a real group. This is real people in a real history, in a real period of time, in a real culture, right? And so they're shepherds, right? So they're out. They're not, you know, they don't have our showers, right? The hot water that you jumped in this morning, right? In the morning. Her hair is probably nappy and nasty and bug infested. It's unclean. It's frazzled. But when he looks at her, he looks at her mess and sees beauty, right? He sees beauty. And there are times, some of you have experienced this, right? It's funny because your wife is like, how do, how do I look? You're like, a mess, right? You look a mess, but I love it. There's something about when you wake up in the morning and Jessica's hair can literally be standing like straight up. Like it's, I don't know how it does it. I don't know what she does in the bed that makes it. And I'm like, wow, you are beautiful, but you're a mess, but a beautiful mess, right? It's, it's kind of like that, I think. It reminds me of Luke chapter 12 when, um, when, and, and when Jesus is even teaching this principle. That, did you know that God knows every hair on your head? He's numbered every hair on your head. In other words, God knows every single detail about you. He knows all of the things that you've thought this week. He knows all of the things that have left your lips this week. 
He knows all of the things that you've done this week. He knows all of the things that he's called you to do and you ignored and you didn't do this week, right? He knows all of those secret sins that you think no one else knows about, that no one else saw, no one else experienced that. He knows those things too. He knows even the hair on your head. But even knowing those things, because of the work of his son, he loves you. He sees beauty in you. Even when you're at your worst, he sees beauty in you. That's the truth, isn't it? That's the truth right here from this scripture. And then it made me think of, this passage made me think of John uh, 12, when Mary, um, she, he's, he's about to go to the cross, right? And he's in the upper room, and Mary uses her hair in the anointing oil, and she anoints the feet of Jesus, right? The very expensive anointing perfumes and oils, right? And she's getting criticized. Why would you spend all that? All that could be sold and, and the poor taken care of for, for such a long time. Why are you doing that, right? And Jesus is like, no, 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 this is okay. The poor you'll always have with you, but, but me you'll have only for a short time. And she sees the value in Jesus, and she's led down her hair as she washes his feet or, or you know, serves him in that manner. And I, my mind drew to that passage and that expensive oil. And it just, it made me stop and it made me think, you know, how much did she love Jesus? She was lavish in her love for Jesus. So yes, God loves us lavishly in this way, but we are also like Mary to love him lavishly. There was no cost too great for her. Even to, to let down her own hair when she didn't have a, a towel to do it and let down her own hair in order to do that. Do you see the beauty in that? Can you imagine what the oils and the perfume and all that stuff did to her hair? But she didn't care what it would do to her hair. She was willing to let it down and to serve and to honor Jesus. Mm. Second verse here says, Your teeth are like a flock of shown ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. What do you, uh, what do you think? You know, talking about her teeth. What do you think her teeth is a shepherdess in the middle of nowhere? Back in this century, right? We're, we're talking no dentist, right? We're talking no toothpaste, no toothbrush, none of those things, no floss, right? None of the, none of the tooth whitening stuff that we put in that tastes terrible, right? And probably causes cancer. Like none of those things does she have. And he's looking at her grill and he's, he's looking at it and, and he's like, you know what I see is I see beauty. I see beauty there. And then he says this, your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Her mouth is lovely. This makes me think of, you know, is it literally like her mouth, right? Because we talked about the no, no dentist, so it probably was pretty messed up. It probably wasn't that lovely. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the meaning behind this? What's he talking about as he's engaging her in this way? I think what he's talking about is the things that come out of your mouth are lovely. The things you say, your speech See, the Bible teaches that what we say is simply just an overthrow, overflow of our heart and our mind, right? So that which we think, that which we believe with our heart, our mouth, it naturally flows from our mouth. Apparently, her speech was beautiful. Apparently, her heart is an insight into her heart, like your speech is insight to your heart. Apparently, she had a, a heart that was good, that was different, that was changed, and that it, it overflowed from her heart and from her mind out of her mouth. Is that you this morning? Could someone say, could your God look at you and say, your, your lips, your mouth, that's all lovely to me. That's pleasing to me. Or would he look and say, that's a, that's a mess. Everything that comes out of your mouth is a criticism. Everything that comes out of your mouth is ungodly. Everything that comes out of your mouth is not encouraging to those around you. Everything that comes out of your mouth is about you and not about others and not about the Lord. Everything that comes out of your mouth really just is disgusting to me. Is that how God would respond to the things that you and I would say? And then it says, your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. You're like, oh, there you go. That's, is that fat cheeks? Because pomegranates are kind of fat, right? You got fat cheeks is what he's saying. But he's, these pomegranates here are a symbol, right? This was thought of as a symbol of righteousness in this day. It's kind of, kind of strange. They thought that there was exactly 613 seeds in the pomegranate, which I don't know. Someone needs to count them this week. You need to get a pomegranate and try to count it this week and see if you can find it, how many seeds there are. 
are, but it was thought that in this time that there was 613 seeds in the pomegranate. And they related that as a symbol for um, righteousness because there was actually 613 laws in the Torah. So it matched, corresponded with the amount of laws in the Torah. So they used that as a symbol of righteousness. So throughout the Bible, you'll see this idea of pomegranate uh, scroll throughout the Old Testament. And it had to do with this idea of righteousness. So when he looked at her, his bride, what he saw was a righteous woman. He saw a woman who was committed to doing right. Committed to her standing, right standing before God. And now I wonder in relationship to us and our relationship with our Heavenly Father, with God, when he looks at you, when he looks at me, when he looks at us, does he see righteousness in us? Does he see righteousness in us? See, I think so many of us may think, well, I'm saved. I prayed the prayer. I walked the aisle. I got baptized. I confessed my sin. I did all of those things. Isn't that enough? And as we read this scripture, I'm mindful that I never want to just sit and say I'm saved and I'm secured and there's nothing there's no other work that I need to do. Now, you're not saved because of your work, but you are saved to do good works. How will others find out about the gospel? It's through our good work. It's through our righteous deeds. Are you a person that are, is righteous enough that those in your family, that those in your workplaces, that those in your neighborhoods would look to you and say, I see their righteousness. There's something different. I need to know what's going on inside of them. I need to know what's changed them. I need to know why they're different. I need to know why they're living righteously. It earns us the right to speak into that. And clearly the Bible says that through without Christ that not even one is righteous. Not one. You're not righteous outside of Christ's work in your life life. But once we're saved, once we know Jesus, once our sins are forgiven, isn't there something in us that wants to do something, do good things for his glory and then for his kingdom? Or are you one that just simply wants to sit and just be thankful and just not let the world see your righteous deeds? See, I, I struggle with those days. There are days and there are times when I think, I mean, it's, it's so secure. I don't need to do anything, and that's true. But I question this. If you don't have a desire to do good works, are you sure that you're even secure and saved in the first place? See, it seems to me that there's this natural overflow that when you and I have been introduced to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we understand the severity of our sin and how unrighteous we are standing before a holy God and when we receive this free gift from Him of forgiveness of our sins and this great exchange has taken place, everything that we were was placed on Jesus on that cross and punished in our place and everything that Jesus was, all of His righteousness, all of His good deeds were placed on us. When we understand this simple truth of the gospel, how can you and I sit idly by? How can it not drive us to a place where we can't help but open our mouth to say good, righteous things and to live a holy and a righteous life and to share the gospel with others? How can it not be something that's so natural for us? But yet, so many of us, we struggle, don't we? Verse 6 says this, Until the day breathes, and the shadows flee. I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. What he's saying here is until the morning comes, like when, when the night is gone, that's when the, when the shadows fade is what it's saying here. So when the, the night is gone and the, the coming uh, or the, the sun is coming up, things are different. This is a different season. I think this is referring back to the first coming of Christ. This is referring back to the first coming of Christ. See, when, when Christ came the first time, he came and he truly, truly dealt with our sin issue. He, God didn't sweep our sin under the rug. God did not ignore our sin. He dealt with it 100% in full 
through his son, Jesus Christ. And he went to a mountain, and he died on that mountain. And this mountain that is, that's referring to here of myrrh and frankincense has to do, it really goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 17, where um, Abraham really almost sacrificed his son Isaac. This was the same mountain where the temple was built. And when it talks about the myrrh and all these things, this was the, the, the incense that was burned at the temple. And this was a, apparently at this point, you know, as they did this as part of their rituals, there would be tons of myrrh and tons of frankincense that were burned at this mountain on this temple area. And that's why it was referred to often as this place. This was a place of this worship where people came and they worshiped and this incense was given off. So there was lots of myrrh used in this area, this mountain. Today, just, to, just for your knowledge, that this is the, the Islamic Dome of the Rock today in, in Jerusalem. So if you go to this place, it's not even, uh, the Jews don't have, they don't occupy it, they don't have it. The, the Islamic folks, the, the Islamic folks actually have this and they've built the, the Dome of the Rock here on this place. There's good news though, according to Daniel 3, that... Apparently, the third temple is going to be built on this same mountain that they're talking about here, right? So, ultimately, this mountain will get back in somehow. I don't know how it's going to happen, right? Read it in Revelation. Uh, somehow, it's going to be back in the Jewish hands again, and they're going to build the third temple, and this is going to ultimately kick off eternity, and Jesus is going to come to this mountain, and all kinds of neat things are going to take place. But this is how you're, you're made righteous, right? So, he came, and he died on a mountain, and, and, and this is how you were made righteous before a holy God. This incense throughout the Old Testament, this idea of the incense, it's a raising to the nostrils of God. This is righteousness of his people, pleasing him. How did we become righteous? Through the work of Jesus on the cross. In other words, if, if you are righteous, if you are in Christ, your good deeds, your righteous deeds are an incense to the Father in heaven. Are you doing good and righteous deeds? Mm. He says this in verse 7. You're altogether beautiful, my love. There's not a flaw, no flaw in you. Not a flaw in you. So you say, whoa, wait a minute. How could there, how could there not be a flaw in me? Like, I know me, right? You're like, I, I know my thoughts. I know my deeds. I know myself pretty well. How, how can it be that God would look at me and say there's no flaws in you? Well, it goes back to Jesus' work. Remember, as I mentioned before, there was this great exchange, as Martin Luther talks about, this great exchange that took place when Jesus went to the cross. Everything, we understand the first part, don't we? We understand that our sin was placed on him, but so many of us stopped there. Our sin was placed on him. He died as a substitute in our place, and he rose again, and that's where we stopped. But there was more to that day. There was more to that moment than just his dying for our sin. It's his righteousness. Who he was was exchanged we received who he was. In other words, all of his righteousness, the life that he lived that we could not live, that was accredited to you and I. When the heavenly father looks down at you and he sees you, he sees Christ and he sees his blood. He sees a perfect saint. That's what he sees when he looks at you. Our goal is to live that out through the power of the Holy Spirit in our everyday life, isn't it? To live that out. See, I believe that what we believe about ourselves really matters. And what Scripture says about us is what we should believe about ourselves. We're going to literally live out of what our belief system is. So what is it this morning that you believe about yourself? Do you believe that you are simply one who is flawed, who before God is flawed, or are you one who sees yourself not as just a sinner, but as one who is a saint? Paul refers in the New Testament to those who are in Christ as saints. When God looks at you, he sees his child. He sees a saint. He sees Jesus when he looks at you. Do you sense that this morning? Listen to this old great hymn. I love it. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to read the words to you. You're welcome, right? You're welcome. But I do want to read their words to you, this old hymn. It says, I've been to Jesus who has cleansed my soul. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of Jesus, I have been made what? Whole. Okay, four of you knew it. Awesome. 
And it says, I've been washed, I've been washed, it's repeated, I've been washed, I've been washed, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. My robe, my gar, my robe is spotless. It's as white as snow. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. He says, I'm daily trusting Jesus at my side. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am sweetly resting in the crucified. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You get this idea that in Christ, you and I are spotless. Our sin is dealt with. We are washed in Revelation when we come and Christ returns a second time and he's got his army of us with him, right? Remember we've talked about this when we talked through the book of Revelation. What are we wearing? White. We're wearing white. We're washed. We're pure. That's the idea that scripture has. When you see white in scripture, it's this idea of purity and, and cleanliness. That is what it is. And we shared preaching through the book. If you come to war, to battle, wearing white, you don't plan on getting dirty, right? You don't plan on fighting fair. Jesus is fighting on our behalf. He offers this invitation. He offers us this invitation. And, you know, He's declaring here that, that she is good, that she is clean, and that she is righteous. And God declares that about us, about his people. This morning, do you sense that in the work of Christ that you stand before a holy God? And I don't take that phrase lightly. Scripture says it's a, it's a terrifying thing to stand in the presence of a holy God. But if we're in Christ, we stand before a holy God, white, sinless, spotless, clean. And some of you just need to hear that this morning. Your sins, your past, wiped away, dealt with through the blood of Christ. When God looks at you, he does not see that. This truth is difficult. This truth is sometimes hard for you and I to wrestle with and to get and to comprehend and to understand. And most of you know we've had a relationship with Deidre and the twins' mother. And, you know, this becomes so real for us in our home as she comes to our home for Christmas and looks at the pictures and looks at all of the things and we exchange presents and, and, and she's integrating her family and our family together. You know, it's such a reminder for me that night. It was very emotional that night just to stand back and just to watch and just to see that God loves her deeply. That he cares. He's called for us to love her deeply and to care for her deeply. And if his word is true, if his word is right, and I believe with all of my heart that it is, that when he looks at her, that he does not see some of the same things that you and I see. He does not see her past. He does not see her shame. He does not see her guilt. He does not see the things that she formerly was and the things that she formerly did as a, as a victim of sex trafficking. She does, he does not see the abuse that she took. What he sees is someone standing before her pure and holy and clean and righteous. And to me, that just blows my mind. It blows my mind. Because I'll tell you, I struggle to see the same thing he does sometimes. Sometimes I struggle with it. But I was reminded in those few hours of being in her home that, yeah, this, she's been forgiven much. I have been forgiven much. The God that pursues me and loves me is the very same God that pursued her and loved her and rescued this from her and has so much better for her. We're in the same boat. We sit side by side as brothers and sisters in Christ in the same boat. Pursuing God, yes. God pursuing us, yes. I'm here to tell you that he's ready to declare you clean and good and righteous in Christ. But I'll tell you this too. He offers you even more than your salvation. He offers you more than that. He offers you the opportunity to be in an intimate relationship with him. That's your first blank. Listen to verse 8. Come with me from the Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon, depart from the peak of Amana and from the peak of Sinar and Harmon, from the dens of the lions, from the mountains of leopards. 
See what he's inviting her into here? This is, this is a series of mountains, the border mountains around uh, the Middle East here. And this is the, the, the highest elevation in the world there is where he's looking at. And this is the land between, this is the, the hostile area is where it is between Palestine and the promised land, right? So this this balance of places between Palestine and the promised land. And, um, you know, even what he's saying is this is, you know, come from where you are and come with me. Follow me. I'm giving you this invitation to join me, to come to this place of the promised land. And, and, and I'm reminded that as he said, this, you know, this world is not our home, is it? This world is not our home. We're, we're living in the heavenly. We're already living in eternity, right? And this place is not our home. And sometimes I think we're too um, comfortable here. He's calling her out of the, her comfort zone, out of a place of her comfort. And he's saying that there is where the lions and the lepers, they're, they're hunting, right? This is their area. He's saying this is their home. This is not our home. You remember you say before we were going to the beach, I probably shouldn't, there's the worst time to show Lane this video, but we were getting ready to go to the beach last year and um, I found a video online on Facebook and it was a lady talking about not getting in the ocean. Have anybody seen that? She's like, I'm not getting in the ocean. That's the shark's house. That's where the sharks live, you know. And she's like, you know, you, know, you don't come over to the shark's house. That's, that's not a good plan, you know. You, the shark doesn't come into your house, right? But, so you, you don't need to go to the shark's house. It was a hilarious video. You need to look it up. She was from Antioch. But she brings a good point. That's the shark's house. She's not getting in the shark's house. For us, this is, this is not our home. This is not our place. This is a place we're passing through. We need to be heavenly minded. We need to, he's inviting us to this idea of leaving our comfort and going to where he is, going into his promised land. So many of them were trying to have a home in Palestine and a home in the promised land, right? They wanted one foot in Palestine while having one foot in the promised land. And you know how ridiculous that is, right? We ought to be accepting this invitation to go wherever he is and to do what he's called us to do. And here's the problem. The problem is it's often a dangerous place, isn't it? It's a dangerous place. You know, oftentimes what God has for us is something that is so unknown, it terrifies us to walk into that place even when he's here with us. We prefer to stay right where we are in the, the place that we know, even though that's not the promised land, right? It's not the things he's called us to. We'd rather reject his invitation and stay in the place that we're most comfortable with, in the place that we know already. So there's, there's this choice that you and I face. We can go with him and be invited by him to go with him into this promised land to be a part of his plans, or we can stay in this Palestine. And he's referring here to Palestine as the dangerous place, right? The place where, where the, the lions and the leopards, all of those are. It's a dangerous place, your comfort zone. The place where you want to stay is the most dangerous place for me. You want to be in a safe place, no matter where in the world it is, it'd be right in the center of his will. You can't be any safer than right in the center of of his plan and his will for you. Is that where you are this morning? He offers you so much more than salvation. He offers you in your second blank an opportunity to be a part of his plans. To be a part of his plans. Now, if you look at verse 16, we'll look at the second part of that. You're going to see her receive this invitation and kind of, kind of jump on this invitation. And in the second part of 16, she says, Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. See, she's speaking after his invite, after his invitation. She's responding here to his invitation. She's saying, I trust you, and I, I want to be a part of your plans. I trust your plans. And she's saying, I fully give myself, I fully submit myself, I fully offer myself to you, Lord, to do as you please. Whatever that looks like. The choice is fruits. They're yours. She's saying, there's nothing I'm holding back from you. There's nothing that, that Solomon, she was holding back from Solomon. I'm giving myself fully over to you. You do as you please with me. Anything, I am yours. Isn't that our relationship with God? Shouldn't it be that we submitted ourselves, the work that he's done in our lives, that we've, oh, we fully give ourselves and submit ourselves to him and to his plans and to his ways? Now, I know that can certainly be difficult, can't it? That's certainly easier said than done. But this should be the, the way that our lives are lived. 
It should be able to say, God, whatever you want to do, I'm willing to do. No matter what it is, I want to be a part of that. And I get that it is difficult. It has been difficult in our home, right? We started this journey of adoption. We say, God, whatever you want to do, we're willing to adopt. Two years later, still no baby, right? It's been ups and downs and... Hey, there's a baby coming. Great. Oh, no, the baby's not coming, right? There's some kids coming. Great. It's going to be forever. We're going to be with them for, for several months, a year, and then it's just a few months, and they go back, and how long are these kids going to be? We don't know what you're doing, Lord, but here's what we do know. You've given us the invitation to walk with you and to do things your way and to respond to you and to be a part of your plans, and we are all in. We'll walk it out. Sometimes it's actually embarrassing, right? You're like, I, we raised money, we were so ready, and then all of a sudden we, we don't have the kid, and you know, wow, we're, we're going, God, what's going on, right? But when we've fully submitted ourselves to Him and His Lordship in our life, we're willing to walk whatever that journey looks like, even when we don't understand the journey. There are no regrets when you're right in the center of God's will. Some of you have been there, right? Some of you got testimony. Some of you got story. You're like, hey, let me, let me have a microphone. Let me share the story. Some of you have been there. Mm. But God is doing things that he's inviting us to be a part of. And we can choose today whether we'll receive that invitation. You know, here at church... At Crossway, we're, we're building, we're just talking in our connection point this morning, we're, we're building a church of those who first have this idea of community, right? We're a community of believers. We're coming together, loving one another, serving one another, being a part. Some of you, God, are called you to join this family and to be a part of this family. Let me encourage you to do that. If that's his plan for you, we want you to be a part and to join us here at Crossway. Others, he's calling today to evangelize and, and serve our community, right? There's so many avenues in which we're able to do that and I think to do that well and some of you need to jump on board with Stepping Stones, the homeless women and children's ministry that meets here at our church and, and be a part of that. God's calling you to this next step to actually get in your get your hands dirty in ministry with real people that have real needs right here at the church and to be a part of their lives and yes, some of their lives are very messy but he's calling you to, to be a part of their lives. Will you respond and join and be a part of that? Some of you is calling to be a part of DCS this morning, right? He said, I've got plans. I've got a will. I want to use you. I want to use this church. I want to use your family in DCS. They're desperate right now. This week we've had conversations. They're desperate for folks to be foster families and immediate foster families. There's a huge process that we're in the process of going through ourselves, but there is a process there, but they're desperate to have families for the kids who are removed from the homes to, to come to. As a matter of fact, there's some opportunity there. They're saying our biggest need is that we have families. There's just some, some of them are 30 minutes or an hour or two hours away to, to get them in. But the first 24 hours once we remove a kid is the most difficult. We need places for, for them to go for the first 24 hours until we can get them to their, you know, their, their permanent foster home. We need, we're desperate for these things. And God is calling some of us to step up and say, you know what, we can offer. We've got an extra room. We've got an extra bed, whatever. We can offer those things to be a part. Now, I'll tell you this. It can be messy, can't it? It can be messy. Because again, these are real people with real needs. And it can be tough. And sometimes, the, the, sometimes it works out to be beautiful, right? There's great stories. Hey, let's tell the story and, and let's get in front of a crowd and share the story. It was awesome. And sometimes the stories aren't as great. Sometimes the stories are disasters. But if God's calling you to walk through it, aren't you willing to walk through even the disaster? Because he's called you to do that. Are you willing this morning to do that? Maybe for some of you is to go to the Dominican. You know, we're blessed that about 15% of our church family has been to the Dominican. That's a pretty amazing statistic for a church our size to have that. But maybe this morning God's calling you to, to be a part of what's going on in the Dominican. And maybe he's calling you to fund some of the, the church and the school that we're finishing and and bring that offering in a very sacrificial way. Maybe he's calling you to, to, to connect even on a, on a greater level to give, but also to go and to be a part of what God's doing there and to rub shoulders. Again, this is real people with real needs in a real community that we've fallen in love with. See, you're not just someone who is saved. You're someone who is saved to something. Saved not because of your good works, but in order to do good works. Maybe some of you, we're going to go in April. Not, I don't, I'm not sure I can go, but there's a trip in April that Doug's going to lead and just a vision trip just to see what's going on in the Dominican and to be in the three communities that we work with and meet some of the folks and listen to some of the pastors. Maybe it's time for you just to go on a vision trip and, and see what God's doing and hear the stories and imagine what you can be a part of there.
Mm. I sometimes imagine, I stopped this week just to, to picture in my mind, what would it look like if, let's say there's 150 of us on, a, on an average week at Crossway, and what if 150 of us just declared and decided that for us, that just being saved, just not going to hell isn't good enough? What if 150 people said it is not good enough? That I want to be mobilized. I want to know God intimately. I want to be totally submitted to Him and to His plans and to His ways. If, if He looked and found a church of 150 that says, that's what I want for us. That's what I want. That's what I'm willing to do. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to follow His plans and His path even when I don't understand it. And I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and I'm going all in. If all of us would do that, I can only imagine what God would do through this body of this church. You imagine the impact of your family on your family. You imagine the impact on this church. You imagine the impact on this city or even in the Dominican. If we would just get serious and say, you know what? Just being saved is no longer good enough for me. I want to be in the action about what God's doing. I want to join him where he is. And we would just see some simply amazing things. So my question this morning is, as we end, are you satisfied this morning with just being one who's saved? Is that good enough for you? Or are you also one that wants to be intimate with him and to be about his plans and his work? It's up to you. I can't do it for you. But I certainly will pray for you this morning.